Vermont, uh, we, okay, but here in Vermont, we have a great opportunity in the next uh, biennium with the uh, liberal and progressive uh, perspective growing within the Senate and the House of Representatives, and especially in the House of Representatives, there will be a far more significant, more padded uh, veto-proof majority will give us a lot of opportunities to work with the new members and to work with the existing members to really advance our issues that we care about around racial justice, economic justice, social justice, criminal re justice reform, affordable housing. This is a moment for us to, to seize this opportunity. And when our obstructionist governor stands in the way, we'll just have to whip the votes even more so in the Senate and the House to, to get it done. Uh, we shall not underestimate how difficult the challenges uh, will be, but let us seize this opportunity. One of the great things about today's meeting is we're going to continue to learn the skills that we need to really move our state forward in, in a more equitable way. We're gonna learn about one-to-one -one organizing. We're gonna learn sort of about strategies. We're gonna learn how to tell our stories because it's so important to have these skills, to have these tools and our resources that we can learn here and bring them back to our communities. And when we bring them back to the communities, we'll have a much broader and much, much larger influence on the ways that we can influence the new uh, legislature. Uh, so thank you for joining us today. I'm looking forward to our to our conversations this afternoon. Great, thank you so much, Josh. We appreciate that. And uh, yeah, got got um, a lot of work to do, but we're definitely building on a on a big win. So it is is very exciting. So thank you. Um, so now we'll move into, uh, since we are a faith-based group, um, we usually start our meetings with an opening reflection. And today, uh, the Reverend Lisa Sparrow has uh, agreed to do our reflection. She's from the southern part of the state, from Wyndham County. Welcome, Lisa. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, before I uh, read my prayer. I'd like to invoke uh, somewhere in the blurb for this. We talked about the first conference, which was out on the picnic tables. And I actually remember that pretty clearly. And I, it's kind of fun now that we're in these little Zoom boxes. If anybody else was there, it was a bright, clear day. And we got to sit outside for some of the meeting. So that would be one thing I'd just like to bring into this room as part of our inception. And what I'm going to read is um, actually a land acknowledgement that was written for the day. <clears throat> um, and I, in particular, want to thank Judy Dow, who many of you know, she's an Abenaki teacher in, here in Vermont. And she uh, teaches in a marvelous course at the Shelburne Museum about how to draft these acknowledgements for particular meetings. And one of the issues, because I know some of you have heard um, I just feel like it's important to give this context is that in the indigenous traditions, there was never a sort of pat prayer. Every prayer was written for the day and in relationship to the day. So I've written this in that spirit with her blessing for you today. So if you would be with me in whatever form of prayer speaks to you. Um, we greet uh, the Pepewar, the beaver moon, now waning, great valley and Dakana, good day. Long mountains named for the trees, Takonek, good day. We can feel the stories of the land we stand on, stories of this land when it was far underwater and the continents were one. Stories of the great push, to make the mountains rise. Stories of the glaciers pushing through to leave this earth bare and ready for the grasses to grow, for white pine, white cedar, tamarack, red maple and beech to stretch into the sky. We give thanks for the Sokoki, the Abenaki people, 
still here and those to come and for those who lived here for millennia for their sadnesses and their celebrations. Today, we woke to the stillness of the frost, to flocks of wild geese, wait tegwa, resting in cornfields and cresting south across the crisp, clear sky. Beaver, Tamakwa, the tree cutter, has completed her dam, and deer, Nolka, move quickly and silently through forests and clearings. Red squirrel, Mikwa, skitters in leaves searching out acorns, and Nahama, turkey, proudly prance with families along our pathways. Today, we hold with gratitude this community of creation, Gadakina, this chorus of companions, and all the great family who have come before, and we feel the blessings of our ancestors here in spirit. We are grateful for Debbie, Melissa, Ryan, and Mike, for Josh, Jean, Joan, Fred, Alyssa, and Marty, and so many neighbors and friends who have labored and loved this land, enough to bring us to this place, this day, and this time, offering gratitude and a blessing for all which is to come. Aho. And amen. Thank you so much, Lisa. That was beautiful. Appreciate that. So now we'll move on to another um, piece of our meetings that are uh, that we that we have um, regularly, and uh, that is our credential, which is kind of an odd word uh, for those of you who are new to VIA, um, but it is the statement of who we are and what we're about, and just helps helps to remind us and to um, to center us in our in our mission and purpose. And today, uh, Rabbi Shana Margolin from uh, Central Vermont, uh, the Montpelier area, is going to share that with us. Thank you. Vermont Interfaith Action is a coalition of more than 70 congregations and also individual people of faith. Our goal is to improve life for Vermonters, to listen, with justice and compassion to understand what people's needs are and to act with understanding, with facts, with data, and with the support of our traditions to make life better in this state. Our member congregations are Protestant, Catholic, Jewish, Quaker, Unitarian Universalist, and there are individual participants also from the Muslim, Hindu, and Buddhist traditions. We choose issues by listening campaigns in congregations and communities, one-on-one -on -one conversations to dig deep into people's experience, to find what the true issues are that people are facing. We have successfully impacted the issues of healthcare reform, affordable housing, homelessness, corrections reform, public transportation, education, and immigration. Once an issue is chosen, our research empowers us to uncover possible solutions, to brainstorm what we can do. Supported by, supported by facts and personal stories of people affected by the issue, we meet with decision makers in large public events, which we call actions, where we push for the solutions that we find, where we push to make life better for people in Vermont. Our goal is to improve the quality of life for everyone, bringing our values as our faith traditions guide us to everything that we do. Thank you very much. That's great. Yes, we are. We are all those things. <laughs> That's exciting. Appreciate that. 
So uh, our next um, element of our, of our uh, usual format is to, um, when we, especially when we have these kind of larger gatherings, um, it, it's, it's a, a form of introduction. Um, it, this is uh, what we call the roll call. And uh, it, uh, usually we do this at, at actions and we, we do this to show the decision makers that we've invited that we have people from all over the state and all different kinds of faiths and um, all different kinds of faith communities um, together. So um, we're going to do that today and um, uh, you will all get to see um, kind of where your friends and uh, friends on Zoom here are, are from. So I will turn this over to Brian. All right, my name is Ryan Page, the community organizer in the Upper Valley of uh, for VIA. Um, when you hear your congregation or your community of faith calls, please do come off of mute, make a minute of noise. We're here to have some fun and to celebrate a little bit today. Um, and this is just a representation. If you don't hear your state, you'll have a, or, or conversation, you'll have a chance to speak that at the end. But if you are from Christ Church Presbyterian, come off and make some noise. We have the First Congregational Church of Burlington. <laughs> Beth Jacob Synagogue in Montpelier. Yay! Guilford Community Church in Brattleboro. Oh, well, in Guilford. First Congregational Church of Essex Junction. Hello! Good Shepherd Episcopal Church in Barrie. Yay, Sisters of Providence. Temple Sinai in South Burlington. Central Co Central uh, Cathedral Church of St. Paul. My apologies. Cathedral Church of St. Paul. First Unitarian Universalist Society of Burlington. Putney Friends. This is a lot Church. of noise for Quakers. Is it like, <laughs> it is a lot of noise for Quakers. <laughs> well done. Christ Church Episcopal, Christ Episcopal Church in Montpelier. Whoops, sorry. Turning it down for Mike. <laughs> Ojavi Zedek Synagogue. The Unitarian Church of Montpelier. Shalom, shalom. All Souls Interfaith Gathering in Shelburne. Woohoo! Good Shepherd Lutheran Church in Jericho. Yay! College Street Congregational Church in Burlington. Yay! Friends from the <laughs> Upper Valley, Bennington, Brattleboro, and Jamaica. Woo! And everyone else from across the state of Vermont, welcome to the 7th Annual VIA Convention. <laughs> Thank you very much. I think we wait. I always inadvertently leave someone out, so I, my apologies if I if I did not name uh, name your uh, individual congregation. But everyone is welcome. And I old meeting house of East Montpelier. There we go. Thank you. <laughs> All right. All Souls Church in Brattleboro. All right. Anybody else we left out? Sorry about that. <laughs> So great, excellent, good to see everybody, and uh, yeah, it's pretty pretty impressive. Uh, we started, uh, you know, with only like seven congregations in Burlington uh, a few years ago, and uh, now we've we've got people all over the state, and it's really exciting. So thank you, Ryan. Uh, and um, so we build this afternoon session as a time for training. And um, we're gonna just dive right in. We're gonna um, gonna use uh, the next um, uh, couple of couple hours to um, talk to you. Uh, basically, uh, lay all the foundation of our organizing model and what we're trying to accomplish um, and how we go about doing our work. Um, and we really thought that this was, uh, you know, we we wanted to do this very shortly after the election because um, anytime there's a changing of the guard, a transition uh, in power um, in the state, um, that, that's a good opportunity for us to, um, um, to uh, renew our commitment to making change and to figuring out you know, what our next phase of um, 
of influence is going to be. So, um, so I actually get to um, start us off with uh, our um, our first uh, segment here, and that requires my finding finding my thing to share with you. <laughs> so hang on one second. There it is. Okay, and we will start the slide now. Maybe from the beginning. There we go. All right. Um, so this is about making change and building power. That is what we are all about. Uh, and the kind of change that we are about actually is um, is is not just minor little uh, petty change. It's about transformative change. Um, we have a a, a colleague who works for our national network who uh, who often says he wa he wants to change the damn world. Um, and so that's that's what we're after is making is making really big change. Um, so what we the way we, that we generally think about that is to um, is to first think about the world as it is. So um, I invite I invite you um, just to kind of unmute yourself and just answer, um, you know, kind of popcorn style. Um, what are some of the characteristics of our society of American society as it is? now fractious fractious yes yeah indeed huh yeah violent violent yeah okay uninformed uninformed yeah angry, angry. Mm -hmm. individualistic yeah yes yeah okay thank you capitalistic greed <laughs> Capitalistic greed, yeah, yeah. Okay. Divide. Yeah. <laughs> Divided. And negligent. Mm, negligent, yeah. Okay, yes. Yeah, all those uh those are good descriptors. Um yeah, the world is not exactly um the most fabulous place <laughs> these days, is it? Um there are a lot of things that are um that are negative that are um uh that make it difficult for some people to thrive um um you know there's there's a lot of inequality also you might add that um um uh, injustice um uh to all the other things that you you know that you guys were were saying so starting with that um our our task though as uh people who are engaged in community organizing uh, is to is to look to creating the world as it should be or as it could be, particularly according to the teachings of our faith traditions, since we're engaged in faith-based community organizing. So what are how is how would that be different? What what are characteristics uh, that would be in place if if we did have a world that was more like the world that our faith traditions describes? Just again, just throw out some descriptors. Good intentioned. Okay. Compassionate. It Be would look like, excuse me. Go ahead. Go ahead, Sarah. Sarah, you want to go ahead? Yes. It would look like Sweden, which is a good Lutheran country. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no bias there. Okay. <laughs> Nonviolent. Not violent. No. Loving. Cooperative. Hmm. Caring. Just. Right. Where people aren't looking for <laughs> ways to survive. Mm -hmm. Right. Just living. connected. Right. Attentive. Yep. Curious. Great. great, thank you all. Yes, yeah, the great, great adjectives you're you're uh, you're throwing out there. Uh, definitely would look quite a lot different from um, from where we're starting, right? So, so our job then is is to actually go from A to B. It's it's to to try to figure out a way to go from the world the way it is now. 
uh, to this world that we can envision, uh, particularly a world that is defined by our faith values. And uh, so on the one hand, that's pretty, pretty simple, right? And straightforward. On the other hand, it's, it's not at all easy. It's very, it's very difficult and challenging. Uh, and for a lot of people, it can be kind of overwhelming, right? People feel like, well, there's no way we can ever, ever get there. We can't make that kind of change. But um, we in community organizing um, feel that we can, and we have a methodology, um, you know, a step-by-step -step process that will help us help us to get there. And then there are certain foundational underlying ideas that we need um, to have in order to be able to commit to, to this, this process. And um, one of them is, um, is the whole idea of building power. Now, um, sometimes this word power can mean a lot of different things to different people. Um, so I wonder what, what do you think of when you hear the word power? Uh, and again, just anybody who'd like to unmute and share that influence influence. Okay. Mm -hmm. Got somebody else. Flowing. Flowing. Alas, power over people. Okay. Uh huh. So, do you do you think of power as a as a negative quality or a positive quality? An influencer for good. Okay. Okay. Yeah. If we have power, we could be an influencer for good. Okay. Yeah. A lot of times, our you know, kind of our teachings from um, well, from society, but but maybe from our faith traditions can um, signal to us that we should feel um, um, negative towards power, right? We, we think of uh, phrases like uh, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts, absolutely, right? We think of the idea of um, um, people, uh, you know, wielding power, uh, treating others badly uh, when maybe we're taught to turn the other cheek uh, or that the meek will inherit the earth. Um, so uh, there can be there can be some tension uh, sometimes, uh, especially uh, in, for people of faith, about ha having power and acquiring power. Um, but um, but in community organizing, what we what we try to do is is think of power more in terms of uh, a very uh, neutral sort of thing. It's 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 the ability to act. It's, um, it's the ability for every human being to have agency over their own lives and the freedom to, to, to act. Um, um, and so it doesn't have to be negative or, or positive. Uh, you know, I mean, it isn't inherently negative or positive. It, it takes on the attributes of the person uh, wielding it or the situation in which it's used. So uh, in community organizing, we particularly want to stress the idea of power with other people, um, so that you know, we think of the the terms solidarity, or, and you know, the the idea of coming together in community um, in order to have shared power, rather than this idea of power being imposed from um, from above and this power over that people with formal power or people who are wealthy or otherwise elite. Um, that that kind of power that they have can manifest itself as power over others, um, but the power of everyday people uh, mm -hmm. who you know who don't have these um, these trappings of uh, power from the outside uh, really comes from working with other people uh, in community, and so that's that's really what we stress in community organizing is this idea of uh, organized people um, that our numbers, uh, larger numbers of people all together is where we, we get our power and how we demonstrate the ability to be able to influence um, decisions that are made in our society and to make transformational change. So that's, um, that's really a very, very foundational concept uh, about what we're trying to do. And so then an organizer, and this is, did anybody recognize the picture of uh, who, this, who this is? trivia question. Rosa Parks? 
uh, close. It's um, L. Baker, uh, same same era, same um, you know, they knew each other. So um, yeah, she's considered one of our first organizers of the civil rights movement. Um, so this is uh, th this is a definition of of an organizer. So this is what we're trying to do. We're trying to help you do um, um, the staff here at VIA. So we're a, pers a person who identifies, recruits, and develops teams of leaders who exercise their collective power and agency by putting their faith into action in the public square. And organizers see themselves and their success in the development of others who are building a powerful organization. So this is one, one reason why, you know, I like this job so much and I, why I think, you know, Mike and Ryan and, and Melissa uh, all enjoy it uh, too, is that we we get to see you folks grow in your uh, ability to influence the world around you. We get to uh, kind of help you and encourage you to find your voice in the public square. Um, we get to um, recruit other people who maybe haven't haven't done that before, uh, but who are so um, concerned and passionate about what's going on in the world that they want to step forward and they want to take more um, responsibility in the world. So all of this is the is a, an exciting part of of organizing. And there's a difference between organizing, mobilizing, and activism. Uh, these these words are all sort of bandied about, um, you know, a good bit. Um, but um, you know, and they can all be all all these different ways of making change are you know are valid uh, certainly and have and contribute different aspects to the whole idea about trying to. Uh, affect societal change, but um, but we're partial to organizing, and uh, so I'll, I'll go through some of the characteristics and, and kind of show you show you why. First of all, um, as I was just saying, we we get to develop leaders. Um, the leadership ability of people, you know, really comes out and, and gets to shine. Um, so that's important. Uh, in organizing, we're not driven uh, by the organizer's interest alone. Um, right, it's not. It's not all about the the organizers. It's not all about the staff people. Uh, the direction of the strategy is based on the interests of the leadership base. So we we talk a lot when we get together with our uh, friends and colleagues at, in the national network that uh, that Vermont and Faith Action belongs to. We talk about about this you know this base of people that are um, you know these are this is the foundation of what we're doing in in the community and. And um, it's, it's all about their interests and um, uh, their needs in changing our systems. In organizing too, we, we focus on, on ongoing actions that are based on this leadership. So the actions uh, you know, continue. Um, and then it's, this could, some people view this as a detriment, as, a, as kind of a, a bad thing about organizing, but it, it's very long-term. Uh, it takes months and months of work, and I know some of you who, who are veterans, um, you, you're, you're well aware of, um, you know, how long it takes us uh, to focus on issues and, and to really um, start to make change, um, but it's well worth it if you get, if you're patient enough and you can hang in there, um, you can see the kind of really deep change that, that you want to see. And the change is also, it's place-based. It's, it's not some kind of generic cookie cutter kind of, you know, thing. It's, it's really customized for, you know, what your your own location, and um, it's rooted in in the community, and it's also connected to um, to a democratic and powerful organization. So a democratic organization, in which you know people really are participating in helping to to make decisions. So so this is why I like uh, organizing. Those are all really uh, super things, but there you know there are things. Uh, um, there are ways, certainly, that mobili mobilization and activism, you know, work as well, but they have slightly different characteristics. They, um, whereas organizing develops leaders, mobilizing might possibly, uh, activism, what we normally call activism, really kind of doesn't. It's not about developing leaders. It's very much more issue-based. Uh, mobilizing people um, could possibly be driven by the organizer's own interest. Uh, activism is generally quite certainly driven by the, the organizer's own interest. Mobilizing um, is, is really kind of a tactic within the strategy. So sometimes in our community organizing, we decide to, to mobilize people, 
you know, to try to turn people out to rallies or to actions or to press conferences. Um, but it, but that usually comes um, uh, from our leadership. Um, and in just general mobilizing, it could possibly come from the, from the leadership, but it may be more kind of top down. And in activism, um, there's, you know, it's really quite a lot about tactics and uh, very frequently it's um, uh, around speaking, speaking engagements, particularly by the people who are seen as the, the key figures um, in, the, in the activist movement. And then um, mobilizing is usually, it's not long-term the way organizing is. It can be kind of sporadic. Um, it involves large numbers of people for short periods of time. Uh, often it can be sort of dramatic activities. Um, and there's not, there's not really that much uh, emphasis placed on developing or, or uh, in developing leadership or uh, you know, investing in people's leadership. And in activism, again, the, 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 organiz the organization is really kind of the uh, embodiment of the activists themselves, and they present themselves as experts on, you know, on the topic. Uh, and again, I don't mean to disparage things I, you know, uh, the, these have all had their place in, uh, you know, different times of, of history. Um, but, um, but I really like organizing. <laughs> I'm going to say I'm bullish on organizing. So, um, so I'll, so I'll stop there for a second and see if, if any of you have any reactions. Yeah. I see Nina's hand. Go ahead. Uh -huh. Um, thanks Debbie. I'm curious about what's meant by leadership based. If you could say more on that. Mm -hmm. So we think really of all, all of you, uh, all our volunteers are our leaders. I mean, we, you know, we, we feel that everybody has the potential to be a leader that, you know, anybody like yourselves who's stepping up and saying, you know, I, I, I think our world should be different. Uh, you know, I have some ideas about how, how we can make some changes. I want to work together with other people who feel the same way. Uh, you're all leaders, you know, and um, and then if you all are really truly working together in a collective fashion, uh, then you then that forms a very powerful base of people. And you might attract other people who kind of don't have as much time to commit um, to to this work. Uh, people that can sort of come in and out who might attend some of our actions, or, you know, but may not be involved in the the the, the leadership base or the people who are really involved in the day in day out you know, meeting of the organizing committees and, you know, really doing the, the work on a consistent basis. Does, does that make sense? Yeah, I, I have a follow-up, but I, I don't want to hog the airtime. So if no one else, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll go later if after others have had a chance. Thanks. Okay, okay. All right, thanks. Anybody, do others have, um, no, I do that. Yes, yeah. Peggy. It just seems like on some level, don't you, do all three. Mm. I mean, there is a bit of activism, like we worked on prop two, which I considered kind of an activism where we were trying to push that forward. Is that not what you consider activation or activism? Or is that more mobilization? Or it, it feels like at some point you, you can use all of those, right? It's yeah, not that I think, you want yeah. to use one. System. Yeah, I think that's true. And, you know, we don't want to want you just to get, you know, hung up on semantics either. Uh, but um, uh, yes, there and there are different times when different methods, different tactics are uh, appro more appropriate than others. Um, but but I guess just, you know, in general, you know, the 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 biggest um, differences are, are, are the the idea of the, of the it, more kind of a more democratic and leadership driven um, uh, kind of organization, um, and, and a law and something that's really, really long term and less sort of less flashy. Um, although sometimes, yeah, there can be times when mobilization or activism comes into organizing. So it makes it a little more dramatic, uh, in spurts. And I think, yeah, the, the prop two, uh, campaign is a good example uh, of that. Yeah. Other questions or? Debbie, I think um, the the idea of of organizing and going in um, meeting with people, whether you set up the meeting or someone else did, um, and but you're trying to get yourself out of the way and your and whatever you think 
some group of people need or something. Mm -hmm. um, or it leads to some real surprises sometimes. I guess that's the one of the interesting things that can happen when you actually don't push an agenda in the first place. Sometimes, of course, we do want to push one, but 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 sometimes when we're really trying to listen, um, an example I thought of from that that ha actually happened to me from a long time ago was that people were meeting together. Various people pulled the group together, but people were meeting together in, in Addison County where each one of us had an outreach position where we worked with people out in the community for different reasons. For We worked for different organizations who were out in the community, but we get together for lunch. And we didn't come to those lunch meetings with an agenda of what we could all do together. But the more we talked about what we were encountering, and we were coming from very different places in our visits, the more um, some of the same issues kept arising. Is that what you're talking about with the the kind of listening thing? Sometimes you yes, <laughs> something yeah. something just emerges that you could actually do when you realize that this is being noticed by a lot of people out in, in this case, out in people's homes. Right, definitely, yes. Yeah, absolutely, that's that's very true. That's a really important part of organizing is, is listening to one another and then, um, yeah, finding where those those issue points are that are affecting uh, large groups of people. Yeah, Nancy? Um, often we can't have, you know, totally, um, uh, discrete categories, but I think for the purpose of training and for thinking about things, um, as you've gone through this and the uh, thoughtful questions, it helps me think about, um, well, as one organization, the VIA, with lots and lots of people connected from lots and lots of different bases, um, it's very important to listen. And then partnering, part, being partners with other organizations let's say for the proposition, um, perhaps this framework can help us understand that some efforts were activist efforts and there maybe wasn't listening or the perceived perception didn't need to listen versus where VIA was coming from. So I was th thinking this framework itself might be useful mm -hmm. to VIA for thinking about partnering. Yes, yeah, no, that, that's that's a, yeah, that's that's a very good point, and yeah, a lot of times when we enter into coalitions or alliances with other groups, uh, if we approach things kind of differently, then yeah, it can be sources of tension, uh, but can also you know if we work through them, can also be sources of growth and 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 just complementary. You know, we can be very complementary to one another if we can you know kind of work through things. But yeah, you know, sometimes that might be highly challenged if the frame of reference of the different allying allies are different. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you for that. Yeah. So Nina, you want to ask your other question then and we'll and then we'll go on. Um so actually mine has to do with um the role of partnerships and um you know how how do we put ourselves in a position where we're not doing the work for others. You know the most vulnerable citizens. We're doing it to the extent possible with them. So how do, how do we develop partnerships where where we all are more effective that way? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, it's always been a little bit of a challenge here in in Vermont um, for us to follow a, a pure form of organizing because really, sort of a the purest form of community organizing. Uh, is to organize people who are directly affected by issues. And our work, you know, has always been, um, and, and there's some other federations in our network that are similar to VIA, but, it, you know, we, we tend to be a little bit more, you know, middle-class people uh, who make up VIA, and we're more, um, we're maybe one step removed from some of the direct effects of the injustice in, in the world. And it's more that we, 
um, we see our neighbors suffering or we, um, you know, we understand um, uh, how systems are broken by um, having people in our, you know, extended families who are, who are experiencing this or, or friends or, you know, so it's a little bit removed. Um, and um, so then, yes, we've many times asked ourselves, you know, does that mean that our, uh, then our work is, uh, yeah, are we being patronizing if we, if we try to help, help people um, or are we being um, insensitive because we don't really understand um, well, so we have to, I mean, and, and those are questions we need to constantly reflect on, you know, um, and we need to, and we need to find ways to, and we have tried many times to, to reach out to people who are more directly affected, um, you know, to, to listen to them respectfully, to, to understand their stories so that we understand the issues, you know, better. Um, but, you know, but I think in the final analysis, we've come to the conclusion that it is, it is valid for people of faith, even if we're not always completely directly affected by something to, to, to take a stand and to say, you know, my values teach me that I don't want to live in a world where my neighbor is suffering, you know, in this way. And that is, that is perfectly legitimate, uh, you know, grounds for engaging in, in justice work. Um, so, but, but we should be reflective. That's, you know, that's a really good, good question and, and figure out that balance. Thanks. So, all righty. Well, let me, let me go on. That's great questions though. You got, oh goodness. All right. Let's make sure, <laughs> let's make sure I can do this. <laughs> Here we go. Yeah. All right. Good. Here we go. Um, so moving along. Great. So, um, yeah, so just I wanted to, again, revisit this idea of leadership development, because I think that that is one of the things that stands out as uh, what's different about organizing as opposed to these other, um, you know, other methods of doing things. Um, and and I also wanted to challenge you folks, uh, you know, a little bit uh, today. So, um, you know, I, I appreciate that you're here because you're obviously interested in your own development. Uh, and so the things that, you know, as organizers, what we're trying to challenge you to do is, you know, make sure you're doing uh, one-to-ones, you're having these one-to-one -one conversations. And Melissa is going to cover, um, cover this uh, a little bit more in her neck in the next section, talking about, you know, the actual practical ways of doing that. Uh, but, you know, we need for you to listen to your congregation members, to people in your community. And... We, we need for you to do that repeatedly, not just not just say, oh, I talked to this person once, you know, five years ago and, now, and I've had a one to one with them, you know, we're done, um, you know, check in with them, uh, you know, periodically update, uh, uh, you know, and then also cultivate them as as followers. And again, I don't mean this in a patronizing way, but just, you know, leaders have followers. So, you know, ideally, you um, you will have, you know, some people around you that you consistently go to and you talk to you know, in your congregation or in your community, you update them on what we're doing on, um, you know, on issues that they care about. And you ask them, you invite them to come to, to our actions or to other, you know, public events where it's important for us to sh show numbers of, of people. So we really rely on you folks, you know, to, to do these things. This is, this is how we build the power that we need to be able to um, make the change that we want to see. And, you know, also reflect, you know, reflect on your own growth, your internal growth, um, you know, show up. I mean, in a way I'm talking to the choir here because uh, telling you to show up, you are showing up, all of you are here. So that's awesome. But that, you know, that's what we, that's what we need, you know. And, um, and then finally, you always be in a, in a learning mode. We, we have a culture, an organizational culture of, of teaching and learning. Um, and that's, that's very important, uh, you know, a very important part of, um, of continuing to cultivate uh, the power that we need to make the change we want to see. And then also, we don't want you to just be developed as individual, you know, singular leaders. Uh, it's also very much about um, developing as groups. So, you know, we, the way that we have organized the, you know, the, or the way that organi organizational structure works for VIA is we have these local organizing committees, LOCs, or and we've now taken to calling um, some, many of them local organizing ministries, LOMs. 
that so we do the work together collectively and that's that's also uh, an important uh, part and and mostly nowadays our our LOCs or LOMs are issue based but as we expand into other regions then we do also try to help folks in different geographic regions have a sense of identity in in their communities so uh, some of the work that we do is also um, regionally based but the but the idea you know we really hope that as you come together with other people and you seek to to work with them that you're that you do keep in mind this idea uh, that we're we're trying to build power to um, you know to to sh to demonstrate to people who make decisions in our world, people who have, have power of their own, who have formal power that we don't have, you know that they have to pay attention to us. You know they need to they they need to listen to us um, because we matter um, because we we and because we have power as a group um, and we, and we can we can challenge them and and hold them accountable. Um, and so, you know, leader, individual leaders, smaller groups, and then that is what builds our whole organizations. That, that is what is going to make BIA a powerful entity. Um, and, and so I, I challenge you also to, you know, use your imaginations. You know, th this work, it, it really relies on imagination. Imagine a world that's different from the one that we have. Uh, and, and, and connect your vision to your faith tradition because our, our faith traditions are all full of uh, you know portraits of, of, of a world that uh, works for every human being that every, where every human being has the respect and dignity and the love and the compassion that they deserve um, to you know keep that in your mind and then dream big about what we can do together as an organization because that's that's what we really really want um, for VIA. So that is the end of my uh, my spiel. Uh, but I uh, again happy to have any uh, any other comments or um, questions before we move on. Yeah, yeah, Sandra. Uh -huh. Yeah, thank you, Debbie. Can you speak to the model that um, it seemed to me we used in the organizing of Prop Two? where we worked as allies for um, a racial justice, um, a racial justice um, organize, organizing group. Um, and, and yeah, can you just speak to that please? Because I, um, I found that very um, uh, um, engaging on several levels because we could speak with our congregations, um, but we also, we're not coming up with this, um, you know, we we're not coming up with this idea ourselves. It was, it was really great to have their leadership and to be um, allies. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, I think especially as we're um, over the last year or so, um, we have decided to um, focus more on racial justice. And, uh, you know, a lot of that is because of what's going on, what was going on in our country. Um, you know the the horrible killing of uh, George Floyd, followed by, you know the the protests and the and the um, the resurgence of Black Lives Matter, and I think that really galvanized you know our whole country. Uh, and uh, you know as white people, you know we live in a state that's mostly white, and um, our organization is reflects that. We're you know mostly white. Um, so, you know, as I was saying before, we want though always never to leave behind the people who are directly affected by issues. Even if we aren't necessarily directly affected ourselves, we, we always want, we want to hear the voices of, um, you know, and amplify the voices of the people who are. So yeah, Proc2 ha has given us a, a, a unique opportunity to work with, um, a group that was led by people of color, um, so you know, black and brown people who were most directly affected by um, uh, by the issue of you know the history of slavery, um, and we're also doing that in some of our other you know organizing work. We have two groups, um, two local organizing committees now that are focusing on racial justice, and you, you'll hear more about those um, you know as uh, later today. Um, but we've also tried to do that you know with other 
uh, other uh, issues that that we've worked on. I mean, we have our you know very active um, affordable housing and homelessness group. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we've we've been very intentional about talking to some of the folks who who are precariously housed, who may show up for um, you know community breakfasts or uh, lunches that. Um, you know, th those are places where we can actually talk with them and listen to them and, you know, and, and get their uh, take on, you know, what's going on. Um, our corrections reform work, we've also tried to, you know, to reach out to um, either incarcerated people or formerly incarcerated people to, to get their stories. Sometimes that requires us partnering with groups that work more directly with, you know, with some of those folks. So, yeah, so we're always, I mean, VI does not work in a vacuum, you know, at all. Uh, we're, we're constantly um, in the, the whole environment of these different organizations that work with uh, people in, in different ways and that come at these issues, same issues from different angles. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Terrific, all right. Well, if there aren't any more questions on this, then I will, um, I'll turn it over to Melissa for our uh, next phase of training. Oh, Mike has, yes, go ahead, yeah. Mike. I just want to highlight part of the discussion because we've had it before and in, in groups, but it's our relationship to power. And I feel myself and other people are somewhat at times hesitant to grab power to use it, to see it as a tool. Because as you mentioned before, there's those instances where power has been abused. And uh, I'm just highlighting note to self that uh, power is the essential tool for making change. Yeah, thank you for that, yeah. All righty, Melissa, I will turn it over to you. Right. I am going to um, Hello. share my screen. Hello. I think that you all should, yes, you can see my screen now. So we are going to be talking about the story of self. Um, and this is a relative, like, it's not a new concept to organizing work. But within, I think, the Faith in Action, uh, which is our national network that we uh, that VIA is affiliated with, they've started incorporating this training a little bit more. And I feel like it's it's really helpful. It's really powerful, and it's one that I have been excited to share with um, with folks in our community over the last um, few months or so. Um, and so. Um, what we're going to do today is I want to um, ask y'all, why, why should we tell our stories? Feel free to come off mute and share why we should tell our stories. I think it's through telling our individual stories that you, A, learn to see and hear people and learn to listen. But also, it helps each of us grow in understanding and knowledge. So I think it's it's powerful in many ways. Yeah. Thanks, Peggy. Any other anyone else other thoughts on this? It's a way of building um, relationships, and relationships connect people, and that is how power develops. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Thanks, Bill. I think somebody else was going to jump in too. Oh, my... gonna... no, that's all right. Go ahead. So Nancy and then uh, Marjorie. Thanks. Uh, I was going to add that telling stories, listening to stories, um, often um, the storyteller can think, well, this is highly personal or no one's going to be interested, but there's most often a theme, a universal truth or a universal experience. And I think this, uh, fits in with what Bill, I think it was you, Bill, who just said, and with that kind of connection to others or helping people connect to you, then relationships build and there's a more willingness to listen and to connect with each other. 
Mm-hmm. So I think there are universal experiences that we have in individual ways, some quite painful um, and some not so hard to share, but it's the hard ones that challenge us to be willing to be brave enough to share with others. Yeah. Marjorie and then Sister Pat. I was just going to say that by um, by sharing our own story, even in groups where the people already think they know each other, like uh, small churches I work with, that um, if they all go around and tell their story, people have learned a whole lot more about each other than they thought they already knew each other. And, and then commit to working together more as well as finding the connections they have in common. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Sister Pat? I think it gives us a better opportunity to get to know each other. And Sister Mary Lou of Benedictine says, if, is there anyone that once we've heard their story that we really couldn't love? And I think it really does deepen our relationships. Yeah, absolutely. All of those, like, uh, yeah, all of that is is why we tell our stories. You know, I think of, I have two young kids. And one of the best ways of training young kids is telling them stories. You can tell them, don't hit, don't hit, don't hit over and over again. But when you tell them a story, right, about how we want to be kind to one another, and we, even though we might get angry, you know, we don't want to take that out on other people, it usually sinks in a little bit better. Still means that you might have to tell them not to hit, but (laughs) the stories bring to life truths in the world that we don't always see and one of the key things and one of the main reasons why i think this this uh training resonates with me so so much is that we have a world that has a dominant narrative okay and when we um when we listen to this dominant narrative over and over and over again um we tend to believe it But if we start sharing our stories and and connecting with others that have similar stories to us, that's when we start building us and we start building the power that we need to shift the dominant narrative. And that is one of the key things I think that community organizing does is it listens to what the dominant narrative is and says, you know, it's great that everyone's saying that, that, uh, that everyone should be able to like, well, I think of the dominant narrative in Vermont right now of like, there are so many places to find work, like everyone's hiring and why can't people just stop being lazy and get off their butts and go in and get a job? That's the dominant narrative. The reality is, is that people can't go and get these jobs because maybe they don't have the qualifications. There's not enough childcare. The housing where they live is too far from the job that they have been able to accept and they don't have the money and it's not worth the, the what they're getting paid to drive an hour, hour and a half to go to that job. And they can't find the housing nearby that that's within their budget if they can find housing at all. And so when we start telling the stories, right, it shifts that dominant narrative. It builds the movement. Um, it's it's one of the key pieces of having other leaders come out because you never know when someone's story is going to resonate and it's going to lift that, that issue even, even further. Um, and, you know, like I said, storytelling, it reaches people, it educates people and it activates people who are closest to the pains of injustice who actually want to do something because they see others have the same pain and they're willing to join with others um, in in moving and and doing something uh, together. And so I look at this as understanding and knowing our own story. And and Nina, I think this kind of gets a little bit to your question for Debbie of like, how do we do this work when we might not be the ones closest to the pain? If we can figure out our own story in this and what our story of self is, that's the way that we can connect to the greater issue and be able to, to, to explain why do we do the work that we do. Um, and so storytelling is the first tool of organizing and all of us need to master this in order to be able to challenge the dominant narrative that we have um, in our own 
local communities in, in the state of Vermont and in our nation whenever we do work on national issues. So there's an art to storytelling, right? Well, before I get to, to the art part, it, are there any questions about why, um, like why we need to storytell? I feel like it's kind of self-explanatory, but I just want to check in and make sure everyone gets it. Okay, so there is an art to storytelling. And um, and I would I would say that there is, I mean, there you can go into so many different ways, but I would say that the public story has three parts. So this is this is the work that we want to work on, okay? There's the story of self, part one. There's the story of us and the story of now. And so when we're working on this art of telling our story, so you know, first of all, when I think of art, I think of something that it takes time. <laughs> right a masterpiece and i wish melanie was here because um or um melinda was here because she she's a um uh, from college street she's a sculptor right and she i remember she did this piece for us a couple of years ago that we did um put up for an auction to raise money for social justice across the region and um i think she told me it took her like almost three years something like, like two or three years to complete this the statue that she had um crafted so when I think of art, remember this, this isn't going to necessarily happen in an afternoon. It could, but it might take time and you might go back to, to it over and over again to craft your story. But, but this art of telling a story has three parts. So the story of self, which is why are we called to what we've been called to? So essentially, why are, why are you, why, why is Melissa doing this work? There's the story of us, okay? What is our constituency, our community, the organization? What has VIA um, been called to and how we have a shared purpose, a shared goals, a shared vision? Um, we can find this in the way that we do our credential, right? Um, that's part of the story of us. Um, but what is it, how can we situate, how can I, how can Melissa situate my story of self in the larger narrative of VIA. And then there's the story of now. And that's the challenge that our communities currently face and the choices that we have to make and the hope that we aspire to, okay? So it's how does Melissa's story fit into the VIA story, fit into the story of why we're working on housing? why we're working on racial justice, why we're working on criminal justice reform, why we're working on immigration. And when we can tell those three pieces together, we have, we have our story of self. Um, any, any questions on this, on the three pieces, on the, on the three parts? Let me do that so I can see faces. I, so I know that this might be new to some folks, but I also have heard that some folks have been working on um, your stories, right? Anything that, that folks that have been working on this that you can think of or any reflections that you have on, on working on your stories? Peggy did have her hand up for you. Nope. I put it down again. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> so today is meant to be kind of an introductory to some of these concepts that might be newer to people that have been with VIA for a while. Um, and this is one of those newer pieces. Um, I think my hope is that we start incorporating this more into our organizing committees and our organizing ministries so that we can all um, be able to tell our stories well. And we might even, I mean, Debbie and I have been talking about this. Um, we've been talking about it in staff meetings of trying to have more intentional training. Maybe we do an afternoon, afternoon story writing class where we come together and we work on together crafting our stories and we take that time and space because it does take probably more time than we have right now to be able to do that. But we have some more tools about, uh, about being able to do that together. And I think that as more of us are able to tell our stories in a powerful way, 
it can really help shape and dominate um, or shift that narrative of the dominant narrative. Peggy, I saw you kind of put your hand back up again. I, I did. Um, it makes me think about um, legislation and, and or not legislation, but working to speak with legislators that it really is in telling stories that you can help people to understand the power of what the conversation is about or how it will impact people, right? And so um, it, it feels like that's really what, leg I mean, Debbie, you can speak to this. That, isn't that what legislators want to know is how will this legislation impact the people of Vermont. So um, on some level, that's one thing they want to know. But it, it feels like that storytelling part is, is so helpful um, on so many different levels. So it's as big as at our state house with legislation, and it's down to who we are as a group. So what are our stories within a group? So it's kind of this micro macro um, benefit, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Earl, thank you, Peggy. Yeah, yeah, and th thank you, Peggy. That's it, we, we hear that uh, all the time uh, in the 10 years I've been working now with uh, VIA. Uh, when we meet with legislators, that's in, you know, just so important, uh, the stories that they hear. Uh, because it takes the, uh, the dry budgets and you know legal language and everything, and just really gives it uh, gives it some flesh and bones. And just a quick example uh, with uh, back right before Labor Day when uh, they were saying that they're going to end the emergency, <coughs> we held a press conference about two weeks later. Had a young mother who uh, she and her husband, who is a veteran, uh, both work. They've got two young children. And uh, they're receiving the emergency rental assistance, even though they both have jobs. Uh, and her story was so compelling with the press and therefore the, the much wider public. And so that, that, I think that really was part of what spurred the, the administration back into action on this. So something they were trying to sweep under the rug, a good story made it just glaring so you couldn't miss it. Yeah, yeah, thanks for that, Earl. Uh, Sister Pat? I guess my, my story is a little bit like girls. Um, I've been talking to some of the legislators about vulnerable adults and the challenges that they face. And then I've been talking to them since 2013, the Order of Professional Regulation, Office of Professional Regulation. And finally, the new director said to me, will you come and testify because your stories are compelling? And I think that's the truth. If, you know, I, I've heard things before, I just had knee surgery. I've had my own experience, and now I can share a little bit more of some of the things that I've seen. And I think the other thing I think about importance of being able to tell a story is like I can be free to tell a story when sometimes some other people are. Like I'm not afraid to lose my job. If I lose my job, my community is going to support me. But there are people if they speak out, they will lose their job or they will be punished or have rep be reprimanded. So. I just think it's important that we're able to tell the stories to help other people. And I think it also helps us to be less judgmental when we hear other people's stories. Absolutely, Sister Pat. Those, those last two points are excellent points that, you know, when we have the courage to share our story, others will, will be able to identify with us and then they will have the courage to come out and be a part of the solution as well. Um, and, and it's, a, it's a hard thing, it's a scary thing, but I think that's what helps change that dominant narrative, um, you know, and, and, and it does, it, it brings things to light in ways that, um, that, that uh, you know, by not sharing our story, we can't get to. Um, and I think also, you know, like you, you shared about your own, how you've had personal experience on the issue that you've been um, um, activated around, which is vulnerable adults that gets to another piece of our organizing um, model, which is self-interest. Um, and, you know, self-interest, I, I don't want to um, misunderstand it as being selfish or um, being, you know, like 
so focused on um, on uh, like my needs, but more looking at it as what draws me into this work. I I usually need to have some some motivator, right, to get me out, uh, to 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 show up for meetings, to show up for press conferences, to want to talk to others, to want to be um, engaged in the work. And it's not that it's it's like we're trying to uh, promote something for our own selfish gain. It is more that we have an interest in this because of what, right? And it could be because it impacts us personally. It could be because the issue impacts maybe a family member or a loved one. Um, you know, we also uh, at Faith in Action, we say like, um, uh, we talk often about like our beloved community or like the folks that we love, like we're doing this because of the people that we love. Um, it could be because we just are really invested in our community and that's okay to have that as an, as an interest. It could be that like, this is what my faith says. This is, my faith is telling me to do this. And, and I feel like this is an act of faith for me. And that, you know, for me, that just makes me be in a better, me be the best version of myself. That's perfectly, a, a perfectly okay reason to be involved in issues around community organizing. Um, but knowing why, we like what our own self-interest is helps us to then be able to listen to and identify other people's self-interest when we are having those one-on-one -on -one conversations. Um, and you don't always need to identify it right away, um, but it is helpful to know why are people wanting to do this work with us? Um, you know, oftentimes when I go and I talk with clergy, like in Vermont, a lot of our congregations kind of keep on shrinking, right? Uh, who are my clergy folks here on the call? You can attest to that, that it's hard to find folks to come to church sometimes. And so one of the ways that clergy could have a self-interest in being part of VIA is that this is a way of connecting with other people in the community that they might not necessarily connect with, and it actually might help build the church or build their congregation, the synagogue, the temple, um, the, the society, the meeting house, okay? It could be that connection Point for people that when they see this faith community has a vested interest in something that impacts them, they now want to be involved in that movement. And that might actually make, make them want to be more involved in the faith community itself. So there's, there's different interests that bring people into the work. But when we can identify those interests, we know why we have the people working with us on this issue together, whether it be with NVIA or our coalition partners. Um, but all of that we can find out through having one-to-ones, which, which brings me to the last topic of, of my little section of training right now. Um, I'm gonna share my screen again. Um, so one-to-ones. Um, sometimes I've heard, I, I heard this from a colleague of mine and I really like kind of this, this headspace for us as a, as a faith-based organization that we're creating holy moments. We're creating moments where we can connect with folks within our congregations, within our community, in a, in a place that can be sacred, right? And when we do that, um, whoop, let me do this one. When we have this connection um, and someone shows us who we are, we should believe them the first time, listening to their story, soaking it in, so that we can really get to understand um, who folks are and what moves them and what motivates them. These are natural but uncommon conversations that we're wanting to have with someone so that we can see their, their values, their vision, their life, what motivates them. Um, and we have four objectives when we do this, okay? One, one-to-ones, we're initiating relationships. And I would say if you've already initiated a relationship, it's continuing to build a relationship. Two, it helps us understand the other's passions and motivations, that self-interest piece that we were just talking about. Three, it helps us gain clarity. I'm sorry, it gives the other person a chance to gain, gain mm. let me start that over again. It gives the other person a chance as they're talking to you to gain clarity over the things that matter most to them. Um, this may not be for everyone, but for me, 
I often gain the most clarity when I'm talking my thoughts out loud to someone. And so sometimes having those conversations, those one-to-ones with someone in your congregation helps them see why, hey, yeah, I really should be a, a part of this housing and homelessness issue because, you know, like I've been trying to downsize um, my home and, and I can't do it because my, my four bedroom, two bath house is worth less than some of these um, two bedroom, one bath house, uh, condos that I've been looking at. And I don't know what to do because I don't want to keep this house, but I can't downsize because I can't afford it, you know, but maybe someone, no, someone would have never thought about that if they hadn't sat down and talked to you and had to one-on-one with you. And it helps us gain information. It helps us know our communities better to know what kind of issues are most relevant and most salient um, to the people that we love. Uh, when we're having these conversations though, we wanna make sure that we have some, these are like the, the, the um, one-to-one ground rules or like best practices, I like to say. We want, these aren't just like get together and chit chat and you know, where the conversation leads, the conversation leads. We want to be directing the conversation. Um, yes, excuse me, you want to get to know people and build that relationship and it needs to be natural. But going in, you should have some sort of an agenda. Why am I having this conversation with the person? Do I want to invite them to come to a LOC with me or an LOM with me? Do I want to um, just hear what what they're interested in, what they're passionate about, what things keep them up at night. You know, what is that agenda that you have when you're going into this conversation? Do I want to invite them to the annual convention to join me in this annual convention to hear about this training? Do I want them to become part of the Prop 2 campaign that I've been working on? You know, we want to be the one directing the conversation and be disciplined about the time. We don't want these to drag out for two hours, right? Um, these are supposed to be intentional conversations that last like 30 to 45-ish minutes, maybe an hour tops. Um, not to say that you have to cut it off right away, but just be mindful of how much time um, that you're spending with folks um, so that they'll want to have other conversations with you in the future. Um, when we're doing these, we wanna be talking uh, thir no more than 30% of the time. We want them to be the ones who are talking, who are sharing with us. And we should be asking like kind of guiding questions or having that connecting point with them, um, but not dominating the conversation. Like I said, 45 to 60 minutes long, sometimes a little bit less. Schedule, one-to-ones are scheduled in advance. It's not like, hey, I bumped into someone at um, a coffee shop at a Dunkin' Donuts, and now we're gonna have a one-to-one. -one. It's like, no, hey, I really wanna sit down and talk to you about X, Y, and Z. Um, can you grab a cup of coffee with me at two o'clock on a Friday afternoon? Um, as much as possible, face to face. Um, I think we've gotten a little, <laughs> and I, it's funny to say this as we're having our annual convention on Zoom, but um, you know, we did this because we have become a statewide organization. We want um, as many folks as possible to have access to joining us today. But I think that COVID has made us um, forget that the best organizing work is when we can connect with folks one-to-one. -one. So as much as po we possibly can, um, in a safe way, of course, um, we wanna have these conversations face-to-face, -face. Um, asking respectful but, but probing questions, going deeper um, about something, not necessarily trying to talk about everything about the person's life in one, one-to-one. Uh, remember Debbie mentioned like doing these repeatedly, uh, not just like a, I had a conversation with Sally one time five years ago, and now I know everything about her and she's in the same place, but, but being able to ask, well, why, why does that keep you up? Or um, why, why don't you want to, um, the community to head into this direction? You know, how would you do it differently? Well, how, how is that, how so is that working? Um, those types of questions. What it's not, we're not doing a needs assessment. We don't wanna just <laughs> rattle off a bunch of needs that everybody has. We're not trying to do a survey, um, although we've used surveys in the past, that's not what a one-to-one -one is, is, is built for. Like I said before, it's not chit-chat, there's a, some sort of an agenda. We're not trying to psychoanalyze people. We are not, well, I am not a licensed therapist. Uh, we, I know that we do have some leaders who are licensed therapists, but this isn't the time for them to be doing a psychoanalysis, it's time to listen. Um, and we're not trying to sell people. We're just trying to connect with folks to see what the needs of our community are. 
Any questions before we move on? All right, I, I know that you all have done one to, I think most folks on this call have done one to ones. I'm not gonna say everyone, but I think most people on this call have had, um, if, if they haven't themselves done a one to one, um, hopefully one of our, the VIA staff has had a one to one with you um, in the past. So now is the time that we like to spend some time in one to ones with folks who you don't normally get to see and talk to. Um, you know, at our annual convention, we're getting folks from all across our ministries, and it's really cool to be able to have those conversations and those connecting points with one another. So we're going to practice having a one-to-one -one right now, and we're going to partner up. Um, remember, this isn't a conversation necessarily. Um, it will seem like a conversation, but it's not just like a back and forth type, get to know you type thing. Um, but we want one person to we want to take 10 minutes for each person to be either the listener, so the one initiating the one-to-one, -one, or um, the person who um, is being the talker, the communicator, the sharer. Um, and so after the 10 minutes, then we'll switch and the person who initially was the listener will then become the sharer and the person who was the sharer will become the listener. And then we'll come back together for a debrief. Melissa, we um, have gone a, a little bit over uh, time. Um, so maybe can, can we do seven and a half minutes for each person <laughs> and take 15 minutes and um, um, so, we, so they're not too far sure. off of when we were going to take our break? Um, sure. Yeah. Okay. I was trying to, I, I, cut, I cut some of my stuff out because I was trying to like gain it's, up that time that we, that we went over. But yeah, we can do that. And um, here are some questions. So I would... I would um, advise, since we're only going to do seven and a half minutes each, and it's going to be really, it, it, you're not going to have a full one-to-one, -one, okay? So let's just remember that, okay? Let's instead focus on um, trying to be intentional about listening if you're the listener, okay? So let's use this time to like not just get to know each other, but to try to, to, to be intentional about listening. So I've put some, oh, let me actually hit enter so that you can see the questions too. I've put some guiding questions that you can put in, um, that you can use. I would recommend that every person reads over these questions and like use one of these questions. So pretend like when you get together that you have um, already been in a conversation with one another and the, the listener is going to ask one of these questions and then spend that time listening to the person's answer. Does that make sense? Um, and when we come back to debrief, the debrief, the, the reflection question that we're going to have is what did it feel like to be intentional about listening? Okay. I think Ryan says that the rooms are ready to go. Um, we will let you know when, when seven, uh, seven and a half minutes are up to then switch, um, so that the other person, um, can ask their question. And if you do happen to finish before the 15 minutes uh, time frame, uh, feel free to come back into the main meeting room. We're just going to be sitting here um, waiting for you all. All right. Any questions? Excellent. Um, I think we're going to pause the recording for now and then we'll go into breakout rooms. See you all when you come back. And Willy Wonka zoomed back into the main Zoom land. Every time we go into breakout rooms, I think of Willy Wonka and that um machine that would tr make folks become smaller and objects become smaller so um anyways let's do a short debrief and i've started the recording again um what was it like to be intentional listeners during our one-to-ones it's, it's just always refreshing mm. Well, being being a pretty good listener anyway, it's it, it felt like a comfort zone. There you go. The the phrase "holy moment" or whatever is more than appropriate. And it has been almost every time I've done anything like this. It's awesome. Yeah, this is my first time, but it, um, it was a good experience of what um person had to say. So it's good. Nice. Thanks for sharing, Rebecca. Yeah.
I like the process because as a as a talker who talks too much and jumps in too often, um, the process um, is helpful. I feel I'm, that, Marjorie. That's why that's why I picked that because I'm the same way. <laughs> Keep my mouth shut and listen. Yep. Yeah, I can understand why you say 45 to 60 minutes, because in my conversation, there were there were times that I was very engaged in the listening, and then I kind of surface and think, oh my gosh, now we've got an agenda. Um, my partner wants to talk for so long, then I have to talk. So it kind of intruded into the story. Um, yeah. I guess all that by saying that um, it is fascinating to to have these intentional moments with questions, because I think when we do have these questions, we give ourselves permission to be authentic and to cut to the quick. Yeah. Well, and that's why having that agenda kind of helps, you know, like it's not that you're trying to monopolize or dictate the conversation, but it allows us to create that space to really engage in that in those moments in a different way that we don't normally do when we're just having chit chat. Yes, yeah, Sister Pat. Well, it always amazes me at how much I can learn about someone in such a short time. Yeah. Yeah. What did it feel like? Uh, oh, sorry, Peggy, go ahead. I just wanted to say that it, it's always fascinating how there is a connection that you can find with someone in that short time too. Right. Yet another reason why we need to be storytellers. Um, what did it feel like to be listened to? Like, so think not, not of you being the listener, but you being the sharer. How did it feel in those spaces to be listened to in that way? I feel like um, since I've been in this meeting, um, a lot of you had listened to me, but out in the community, um, I feel like that sometimes I don't, sometimes in this community, I don't feel like I've listened to. So I'm grateful that I met Melissa and, and Debbie through this Justice Alliance. Yeah. Yeah, Frank. Yeah. I've, um... I think doing this right and just slowing down, um, I found myself being able to get to a level of um, uh, openness that um, or I was invited into a level of openness that there um, <clears throat> that I don't often get to mm. um, with people. Yeah, maybe one or two more. And if, yeah, Fran? I, I like being listened to. It makes me feel important. Mm. <laughs> yeah. And and you are important. <laughs> uh, I, like, I like the experience of being listened to because especially when we have these guidelines, um, I, I feel more confident in, in speaking. I experience so much of the time I will start a sentence and somebody will break in. And now I, I kind of do it as, as a hobby. How many times can people um, just erase me? And it's, it's comical. I mean, it's, it's, it's comical because I don't look at it as my problem so much as how our culture hasn't really taught us to be careful listeners and respectful listeners. So it's nice <laughs> to find this yeah. forum here. Yes, yes. Well, that's a good note for us to take a short break on because you know part of the reason why I wanted to, to focus on being that listener is because I want us to remember what it feels like to be listened to. And so that as we go out as leaders to have these one-on-one -on -one conversations, that we remember that feeling of being listened to and be that, that listener for others so that others can have that same type of feeling and connection. And we can build a movement together around the issues that, that matter most to us and would have lasting impact on our communities and the people we love. So with that, um, uh, we are going to 
um, have um, a five minute break and then we're going to come back and talk about public versus private relationships, talk a little bit about agitation and a little bit more about the VIA model of organizing. So um, take a short bio break and then we will come back in at four o'clock. Come on, Kemi. Let's go take a walk. This next part is um, is something that we haven't talked about a whole lot uh, in VIA. Uh, so this will be new even to some of our veteran uh, leaders. Um, but I, I so we'll just do kind of a quick introduction to this uh, concept, um, and uh, we can do you know follow up trainings later. Uh, but it's this this whole idea that we that there are different kinds of relationships that we that we have in life. And um, in organizing, we have to be careful about the difference between, um, between public and private relationships. And um, so what we mean by that is uh, there, there are different, different kinds. So, um, so here's a little exercise we can do um, to talk about um, which of our relationships are meant to be public and which are private. So let let me let me pick somebody. Um, so uh, so Nina, um, are you there? Are you still there? Did she go away? No, she's there. You there? You are. I'm, sorry, yeah. I'm having a snack. I didn't want you. Uh, oh, that's quite all right. It's <laughs> <laughs> sorry. <laughs> so I'm going to ask you. Um, so here, so you're 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 going to go away on a journey, okay? And you're actually going to be doing a um, uh, kind of work trip. Um, there was a hurricane in Honduras, and it wiped out villages and towns. And so you're, you're going to go on this, uh, this uh, trip that, that your church is sponsoring to um, deliver supplies and rebuild a village. And, and to rebuild the village, you, you, you need people who have expertise in water supplies and, and houses and boats and farms. And you're going to be there for an extended period of time. So who would you pick? Um, what kind of person would you take with you um, from your community? Well, I'm apparently I'm looking for people who um, I, I, I'm going to need people who know how to do the work, right? Yep. Yep. So I'm going to be looking for people with the required expertise. Yep. Yep. Very good. I, I don't know if you're looking for something. Nope. That's exactly what I'm looking at. Yeah. Don't overthink it. Okay. <laughs> All right. That's perfect. That's perfect. I love it. That's a great answer. I love it. Okay. All right. So uh, let's pick somebody else. Um, uh, who's, who's, who's up and let's see, Peggy, are you, are you around? Yeah, Peggy, I'm going to pick you. Okay. So, okay. so you are going on a journey, but it's, it's a pleasure cruise. Okay. Ooh. You're going to stop. Yes. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you're going to stop at islands. You're going to lie on beaches. You're going to play. You're going to daydream. You could take somebody with you. Who would you, who would you take? Uh, I would take someone who's also interested in all those kinds of events and activities and who is pretty darn fun, I think. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Absolutely. Somebody you'll, you'll have a good time with, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. And okay. So Fred, I'm going to ask you this one. Okay. Um, so you're, you're going away on a journey, yeah, but you're, you're, you're like, you're like moving, you're like totally like moving to another place. Um, you know, you're not coming back here to Vermont. You're like, I don't know, you're moving to Arizona or something. Uh, you're not going to have any contact. You know, I mean, it's, you know, you're just uprooting yourself and going away. So who, who's going to go with you? Who's going to go with you on that trip? Well, I hope my wife will go with me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Bingo. Um, excellent. Excellent answer. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Exactly. All right. So, so these little stories are meant to illustrate uh, the difference between the kinds of relationships that we have. All right. So the, the first one was, you know, Nina said, I'm going to find somebody with expertise in those, those things, those tasks that we need to get done. So that's kind of basically a, a business or work relationship. And that is very public, right? Um, the next one was we're getting you, Peggy's going to go and have a good time and go on this cruise. And so she wants to take somebody fun, somebody she likes, 
that's a friend relationship. Okay. That's, you know, that's, that's a pretty private relationship. And then the final one is the most private kind of relationship, the core private relationship. You know, if you're going to move away and uproot yourself, you're going to, of course, take only the people that are closest to you. So Fred's going to take his wife, right? So this, so, these are the different kinds of relationships that we, um, that we encounter, you know, in, in our lives. And, uh, you know, here's another, here's like, you know, two categories, another way of looking at it, you know, public relationships are, they're organizational, they're, you know, professional people, uh, um, in, in, you know, in faith or politicians or teachers or social workers, or, you know, those people that we go to see uh, for our public um, needs. And then the private relationships are, you know, they're people in our family or they're people that are friends or, you know, people that we knew from college or high school or, you know, whatever. So, um, so those are pretty obvious, right? So the, the reason that we bring this up in organizing is that when we have certain kinds of relationships, we don't want them to cross over into the other kind of relationship because we can start uh, when, when we have these kind of blurred lines, we start getting into a little bit of trouble. Um, so uh, I, I think you'll, I think that'll become clearer as we go along here. So the public relationships, you know, we want, we want to be respected. Um, we might, we might even be jockeying for power a little bit with the person. Um, we, we are negotiating uh, with them. We're focusing on the outward, on the community. Um, we're, you know, we're talking about, uh, you know, an agenda, um, you know, we want to be treated with respect. This quote from, you know, Cornell West is, you know, it's about, uh, you being treated right. And that's the demonstration of what, you know, justice is, um, you know, in, in, in the world. Uh, but so all of these are sort of, you know, out these outward facing sort of things is, is what we're trying to, to acquire. Whereas in private relationships, you know, we want we want to be loved. We want to have intimacy and acceptance. We're not we're not contesting for power with the the people. We're not you know hopefully not negotiating uh, you know on things. We're you know it's just we're, it's just a straight up emotional kind of relationship. But if we if we start to blur the lines, then um, it can be a problem. So say for instance, and it, and it can be really be a problem in Vermont, in a place like Vermont. Okay. Uh, because it's a small place, right? So if we're, um, if we're trying to, um, for instance, get the, um, you know, uh, one of our state legislators to, uh, vote a certain way on a bill. And we also, it turns out that that legislator has a, has a kid that plays on the same soccer team as my kid. And we, you know, so if you talk to the legislator in the state house about, you know, the, the bill, and maybe you have a little, you know, you got some conflict going, maybe that you don't see eye to eye on the bill, but then you run into the legislator on the sidelines at the kid's soccer game. If you start trying to like, you know, persuade them, lobby them, you know, at, at the soccer game, you know, what's going to happen? What do you think? What, what, you know, how's that? Oh, you back me down. Sorry, go ahead. How, how would you, how would you guess that the legislator might, might react? I would say negatively. <laughs> uh-huh. And why, why would that be? Well, there, that's, that's not where the business of, uh, that, it belongs the, the business of, of what you of, right okay right yeah so that so the person might be uh a little resentful that you're like horning in on their time with their kid right yeah uh yeah it's it, exactly it's not where it's not where it belongs right yeah definitely thank you yeah and then what can happen the other way um too is uh say say you um well, this kind of actually happened in, in Burlington. So we had the mayor of Burlington had, uh, before the pandemic, he started this group um, of like different organizations in the city. And he invited, invited us to come. He, NBA was one of them. And he invited us to meet with him like monthly. 
and and he want, wants to talk about well, now ostensibly what he pitched to us was that he wanted to hear our ideas about development in this in a city and um, you know, particularly about property development, housing development stuff. Now we all we felt special, right? When, at first we thought, oh, isn't that cool? Isn't that nice that the that the mayor thinks so highly of us that this is you know what we're doing. Uh, and, he, and then we realized that actually kind of what he was doing was he, when he had an idea about something that he wanted to make sure got public acceptance, he would bring it to this group first and sort of, you know, and sort of strong arm us a little bit or, or kind of cajole us, you know, because because we thought we were so special into, um, you know, accepting it and thinking it was a great idea and then telling people in the public you know, oh, we support this because, you know, we love the mayor and the mayor's being so nice to us. Um, so you, you, you see what you see what the problem could be <laughs> there. OK, you can get used by, you know, if you have if you blur the, the public, what should be a public relationship, turn it into a private one. You know, you, you, you can feel manipulated or, or used um, or, or if you do it, you, you know, in another way, uh, you know, to people in power and you kind of uh, infringe on a, a public, a private relationship that you legitimately do have with them, you, you can make them feel resentful and feel like you're speaking to them inappropriately, right? So, um, so I don't think I'm going to go into a lot of detail about this um, uh, today, but I just want you to to be aware that this is you know this is a problem. This can be a problem, and I think it's a particular problem in Vermont because we are such a small state and we can run into people in different you know um, different arenas like this. And then also you know we also have had the I mean I was I used to be a state a state legislator. Uh, Mike is actually a state legislator now. Um, so we we have, uh, but I I do want to assure you that we have rules with the board you know guidelines set up very that are very strict uh and and uh memorandum of understandings that we ask people to sign to to really make sure that we're not um you know we're not again that we're not blurring those lines that you know um like when i campaigned i couldn't use any of the of the ia's resources or uh equipment you know i couldn't do any of my campaigning on bia time um, you know, um, uh, so anyway, we try, we try to be very cognizant of that, of these, the difference between public and private relationships here at VIA. And, um, we can talk more, um, you know, in, in subsequent teaching trainings about, you know, how, how, uh, to, how to handle, uh, these kinds of things, but I wanted to sort of expose you to, to this idea. Uh, because it is it is important, and again, it, a lot of it is about power. It's preserving the power of the organization, right? We because we can if we blur lines too much, we can cede some of our power, uh, or we can misuse uh, our power, and um, and so we need to be careful about that. So, any just maybe one burning comment or question um, that we can keep going with our time. All righty. So anyway, there you go. A little tangent. Oh, Catherine, go ahead. Oh, I just wanted to say that um, in my experience, um, I went I went very naively and um, I what idealistically into a group, a neighborhood organization group, and um, these people took an interest in me and I was flattered by this. I was, I was in my thirties at the time. And um, what I realized was they may have seen me as someone who could influence people and they wanted to work me into their corner. And then with me supposedly in their corner, they said things I didn't at all agree with. And I really felt used and it was a very valuable experience because how do you go from naive to experienced? <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Definitely. That's the kind of thing we're talking about for sure. All right. Great. Well, thank you for that. And let's uh, see. I think it's Melissa's up next. Is that right? Yeah. We're going to uh, talk a, just briefly about. Um, 
some of our favorite things, agitation. <laughs> this is a this is a long time organizing principle here of um, of agitating um, folks uh, around issues, uh, getting a little bit more clear about who we are, what we're doing, why we're doing it. Um, but it's not one that we at at BIA have traditionally talked about. I think part of it has has to do with our culture. You know, in New England, we we don't like conflict too much. Agitation's a little bit too too far for us. Um, but I think that it it might be because um, we look at agitation and it kind of goes a little bit against the culture. But I think if we look at it just slightly differently, we can see the value in how we have to use it in order to do the organizing work. So um, let's get into this here. So I wanna situate this, this is kind of a simplified version of the organizing cycle. Um, and I just wanted to show this briefly to you so that you'll see where in the organizing cycle this typically takes place. And I would say it primarily takes place in the listening session, in, in the listening section. Although it could also take place in the research, research section um, for key people, not necessarily when we're trying to gain information, but if there is a, a public figure who we want to agitate around the issue, we can do it then. But it's primarily like situated in the listening section of the cycle. So for those of you who do not know, this is my family. Uh, my husband, Shadi, my daughter, Amelie, and my son, Siraj. And I wanna share this picture with you because I think it is, it can help us understand how agitation, even though it's uncomfortable, can be a really good thing. Um, as I'm raising my kids, okay, I am wanting them to be the best version of themselves that they can possibly be, right? And there's all sorts of things that go into that, that take place, that have to take place in order for them to, to get to this version. And when they are young and small, they're, they're a little bit helpless. Um, they don't have a lot of power, right? But I want to help them walk into their full potential, into the power. Just today, <laughs> before this uh, session, my, my son has an IEP. And so we were at the school, sitting down with his teacher and the special educator, walking through what his plan will be to help him be successful in school so that he can be powerful, so he can be himself. Not in the sense of like being able to reign power over people, but just in the sense of like, he knows who he is and he's confident in that and he can go on to, to do whatever it is that he is destined to do. In order to get him to that place, I have to agitate him at times. He gets really annoyed at me and upset at me sometimes. And I have to do it because I love him, because I want him to be in that powerful spot. And so sometimes when we are having, when we are doing this work, both within ourselves, within our congregation, and with some of our allies who are elected officials, we have to do a little bit of this agitating, okay? And what that looks like is agitation should be a lovingly, dis should be when we lovingly disrupt people who we know, okay, so first of all, agitation has to take place within a relationship, okay, so who, with who we know to bring their awareness to what is getting in the way of them stepping fully into the most powerful version of themselves. All right, I want to say that again, because I think it's, this helps, this is going to help us understand why we need the agitation both within our lives and we need to be agitating one another and those elected officials who we are in relationships with. So agitation is when we lovingly disrupt people who we know to bring their awareness to what's getting in the way of them stepping fully into their most powerful version of themselves. And when possible, we're gonna walk across that bridge with them so that they know that they're not doing this work alone. And I think like it might be a, it might be a little bit um, weird to think about this, but what I think about is when I first started doing this work, 
like 12 years ago almost now, um, I was an organizer around healthcare. Okay, and this was right around the time when the ACA was being passed, um, the Affordable Health Care Act was being passed. And um, because of our relationship and because of, of who our senator was then and still is, uh, Senator Sanders, and his vocal um, his vocalness about passing the ACA, we would often get called down to DC to, to meet with other faith in action or um, federations and, and do work down in DC together. And there was one time that we were heading down to DC and Senator Sanders wanted to, um, uh, to have a press conference and he knew that there was gonna be a delegation from Vermont. So he wanted us there and he wanted someone from Vermont to share their story. I'm a new organizer, okay, and, and I'm new to BIA and I'm new to the state. So I didn't really know what I was doing at the time, but I remember having a conversation with a leader and asking her to be this person. And at first she was like, oh no, I can never do that. I can never do that. I, could, I, could, I can't get in front, um, you know, of the TV and radio and be, and telling my story. And oh my goodness, a, a senator is asking me to do this. I can't do this. I worked with her. I, I had, I, so I had already had a, been building a relationship with her. And I, I remember asking her this one day, what are you afraid of? What are you afraid of? What's the worst that could happen if you say yes? And she was afraid of looking like a fool. She was afraid that her story would not resonate and that, that, she, that she would not, that her voice wouldn't be heard, okay? And I said, I will be there with you. I will work with you. I will help you. I will, so literally I was trying to help her cross that bridge, right? She ended up delivering an amazing like two minute story um, of, of, her, of her children and what it meant um, for her kids to have access to healthcare um, and how she has children who have children who live in, in Vermont who don't have access, but she has children who have children who live in Canada that do have access and what that difference looks like. And how as a grandmother, it's hard for her to watch her kids and her grandchildren in Vermont not have the same access or her grandchildren in New York actually not have the same access as the ones that in Canada do. And after the end of that press conference, she had so much more um, like just, she felt more powerful. I mean, the, blunt, the, the, the short answer is she felt more powerful and felt more confidence and like she could do and say more because of that experience. And so sometimes as we are having these agitation um, conversations, we might have folks say they don't feel valuable, okay? Maybe they're not worthy, of, they don't feel like they're worthy of love or they're not enough or they're not strong enough to get across the bridge, or they're not smart enough to get across the bridge, or not bold enough to get across the bridge. But when we come in with an agitation, like when we're doing like a one-to-one -one and we can agitate them and be clear about why we're having this conversation with them, asking them permission, can I, you know, can I push back a little bit? Like we know each other, can I push back a little bit? Like what I did with, with the leader, around the ACA and we can get them to admit out loud, what are you afraid of? What's, what's going on here? You know, I hear you say that you wanna see access to healthcare for everyone, but you not wanting to speak up, I think that's interrupting your ability to really build power in this moment. Is that what you see? And if that's not the truth, if that's not what the person sees, say, well, then what is it? What is, what is hindering us from building this power together. And then, and this is the conversation that um, at the time I didn't know how to have this conversation, okay? So I didn't ask her this question, but looking back and wishing I could have go back to my organizer 10 years ago, um, ask, what is it costing you? Because I would have loved to have heard in that moment what it felt like it was costing that leader to, to um, if she was not, willing to step up and, and share her story? What would it have cost her um, to not be willing to tell her story in a public way? And if the price is too high, what are you gonna do about it? 
because in that moment, it could have cost having the ACA not pass. I mean, I don't think it would have hinged on her one story, right? But like she, she got to be a part of the ACA passing. Um, and so her, her grandchildren in New York could have the same access to healthcare as her grandchildren in, in Canada. Um, but like, was she willing to, to give that up um, because, because of, of the things that were keeping her back? And so sometimes when we're in this work, we have to have those agitating conversations. And what I would also say is, you know, when, when it comes to, um, to ourselves and to like within, within maybe our organizing committees or organizing ministries in our congregations, um, the agitating conversations might look a little different. It's like, how are you gonna step into this power? But we can have those same conversations with legislators. Because sometimes when we're asking legislators to be champions for the, the issues that we care about the most, there are going to be things that are holding them back. And it may look different, but we might need to have some of those conversations to agitate them to be the champions in this moment to say, yes, I'm going to sponsor a bill. Yes, I will stand up in committee and tell the reasons why I do believe that we should support this bill, even if it's not popular in that moment, you know, but helping um, elected officials to be able to, to, to cross into um, their own power around the issues that we care about the most that we are bringing to them. I'm gonna stop there. there is, this is a real truncated version of this training, right? So like, once again, we're just giving you kind of a short little nibble and we do plan on unpacking some of these a little bit more throughout the course of this next year, but are there any questions about agitating? This seems a bit like the um, PG version maybe of agitation. I thought of agitation as more of a um, stronger one end of the activism scale kind of maybe more of the yeah i think i think you might be thinking about like escalating right so like if we're going along and um with an issue and it's not we're not having any traction we want to like ramp up the the tactics that we're using and i think i would call that maybe escalation of tactics I think the agitation, I think of more like the story of the princess and the pea, right? Do you remember that story from childhood where there was like a little tiny pea and, and the prince was needed to marry a princess and only a princess would be able to feel this little teeny tiny pea underneath all of these blankets and mattresses. And I, I think of agitation more like that, like it's something that is uncomfortable, but when you're doing it in like a, a loving relationship, or, or, or in a personal relationship where like you've already built and you're, you, you care about the person, you care about their well-being, and you care about the community that you're trying to work on the issue with, it, um, it can be something that moves people into a powerful way. So it's not like a strong arm tactic necessarily. It's just, it's, um, it's something that makes people uncomfortable to move them into their fullest uh, potential of, of being as powerful as they can be on the issue that, that you're working on. Yeah, Fran, you're muted. You're not talking about the target. You're not talking about people that you really totally, no. utterly disagree with. Okay, no, you're no, talking no. about, okay, right. Okay, now I understand. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, the agitation would be like within myself, like what is keeping me from okay. really being powerful in this moment? What is keeping those in our local organizing committee or in our congregation from stepping into the into their own power on this issue? What's keeping elected officials who, you know, who in, in conversations, we know they're for this issue, but when they get into the state house, for some reason, they like clam up or they don't say anything or they don't speak up. What's, what's keeping them from that? That kind of agitation is what we're trying to, um, but is what we're talking about here. Not necessarily the targets where we have to escalate our tactics um, to push people to, to that point. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, if there's no more questions, I think I've just brought us up to time on our schedule. Woo hoo, 
did not know if that was going to happen, but we did it, folks. <laughs> I'm going to hand it over to Mike now. I think he's next on the agenda to talk about the model of building teams and LOCs and all that jazz. Well, thank you, Melissa, and, and everyone. Thank you for taking this time today. Um, can everyone hear me okay? I've uh, ruined my reputation here by being unmuted to start with. It's usually my middle name here is you're muted. <laughs> um, I'm going to talk a little bit about organization, team building and issues, but I'm going to start a little bit with, with motivation. And I'm going to, I'm going to share a story from uh, the Quaker meeting that I'm part of. And with our Quaker meeting, uh, we have a, a Sunday school, we call it first day school, and usually the children would go to be in Sunday school for the first 50 minutes of the one hour worship. And then for the last 10 minutes, the children would come in and join us. And they'd usually do a project or uh, have a story or some activity from little ones on up into elementary school. And this one day, uh, the door opened to the worship room and uh, kids started coming in and this, this uh, preschooler comes running in. She had a picture she had drawn and she's waving it. She says, mommy, mommy, look, I made God. And of course she did because we are the face of God here on earth. We are the hands of God. We are the voice of God here on earth. And uh, I look to that as my motivation for the work that we're trying to do, that we are taking the actions uh, on behalf of others, but we are having the spirit visit us through our hands, through our feet, through our voices. And that's how we're, we're trying to bring the spirit alive here. Now, I had a, a picture here and I'm trying to find all my pictures for what we're gonna do. I'll start with this one, see if we can share this. Not sure if that's coming through on the screen. Yes, it is, you're good. Yeah. Oh, good. Well, I'm going to start, I guess, with, with this picture here around uh, discerning issues and uh, discerning issues separate from the problem. Now, we have the, the whole loaf of bread as the problem that we're looking at, and the issue is the slice that we're going to take right now. And uh, we're fortunate right now that we've had a very direct experience with Prop 2. Now, the, the loaf of bread, is, we could see, is systemic racism, which is a, a big problem. It's a big loaf, and the way we address it is, is take one piece at a time. Uh, we, we work the process, uh, especially in working with the Vermont Racial Justice Alliance that started four years ago, really five years ago, that this was going to be something we were going to put on in, on, in our constitution and in front of voters. Uh, it actually opened up some wonderful opportunities, not just to talk about the constitution, but the history. And, and I'm hoping all of you have seen the presentation that uh, Debbie put together because it got into the history of why we were doing this. And that was one of the concerns that kept coming up when I was presenting this to, to people, whether we were tabling or uh, canvassing, it was not uncommon for people. And these are people who I, I would consider either good liberals, progressives, open-minded peace and people who would say, why are we doing this? I thought we did this already. And uh, the answer I usually give is, well, uh, with all due respect, the, the perspective from people of color here is this is really important, that this mm -hmm. is a cloud hanging over us within 
within the reality that they live in of systemic racism. And then the progressions went on from going back to um, emancipation, reconstruction, uh, Jim Crow laws, the black codes, the great migration, redlining, uh, to bring us to today as the inspiration for why we were taking this on and, and why this issue was prominent for us. Now I'm gonna try and put another slide up here. And let's see. And how's that? Can you see this one? Yep. Yes. Right. Yes. It's nice when the technology works the way it's supposed to. And I'm not quite sure how I did it or if I could ever do it again, but it's working right now. So I'm gonna go with that. I'm, I'm not one of the most um, adept at some of the technology we're working here, but how we look at an issue is, uh, an issue is specific in regards to an individual or, or institution. It's immediate something we want to get done soon. It's concrete. We want something that's uh, concrete and actionable. It's winnable. When we were trying to put together the, the outcomes we had hoped to achieve through Prop 2, um, certainly we wanted to get this passed. And uh, I think we got over 80% of the vote on this. No. Debbie, do you remember the exact number? 82%. 82%. So we, we did that. A lot of people did. And that was the, the target. We were also looking, though, to, to make it clear that uh, this was an educational experience as much as anything. And it was just one step, one slice off the bread. So. Uh, We've got a lot more to do. It's, it's wonderful to have this experience right now and we can revel in this for a day. Um, but this is where I, I like sports analogies because in sports it's, well, that was yesterday and what have you done today? So we, we've certainly got more work to do. Um, I've got one more slide here and let's see if we can get that one in there. Yeah, let's see, I'm not really. I'm not finding it right now. So I'm going to describe the slide because you've probably seen this graphic before. Uh, the picture is, from far away is what looks like a really big fish. And it's pursuing a fish, another fish. And if you look at the big fish, it's actually made up of lots of tiny fish, much smaller than the fish that it's pursuing. And in that way, uh, we're, or, it shows how organizing makes each one of us much more powerful and, and able to affect change. And that's, that's the main reason behind why we organize together one of the things that I, um, there we go. <laughs> Organize. Together, there's a lot more that we can achieve than individually. It's one of the things that when I go to churches to talk about VIA, I remind them that you join our group, you're going to join with thousands of other people, 17 other congregations around the state. And be fine if we want to affect change and talk to policymakers and say, well, we've got 30 people who come to church here every week, as opposed to we've got 10,000, we've got 13,000. That's the beauty and the benefit of organizing, that together we are much stronger than, than any one individual or any of us as, as one, one church group. Um, the reason we want to organize is we create power 
and power is what we need, the action to affect change. Um, I'm not sure how many people here, but a, an open question that I wanna put out here uh, is if there's anybody who was part of the Prop 2 efforts, I wonder if you could share how this, this effort relates to your individual work to make, make this happen. Does anybody have any experience they, can sh they wanna share about the Prop 2 experience and advocating for that? Hmm. Katie. Um, well, well, certainly, um, I was I was called by this this VIA team in Wyndham County to to work on this, and it it was a no brainer. Um, how could we have this archaic language? And then people saying, "Oh, that's just archaic language." And it's, it doesn't matter. And I'm thinking, I, I can think of half a dozen ways it could be um, weaponized. Um, and so certainly I, I worked with a group of people to, to um, educate them. The thing that, that really got me going was when I read a letter, uh, an opinion piece in the Brattleboro Reformer by an attorney Stephen Fine, who was saying there's a big problem with Prop 2, because what are you going to do when, when it passes? And then the prisoners say, well, we don't have to work anymore, you know, for, for nothing or for very little. And I was thinking, wow. So we are we are very punitive in in our biases still um and and this so so anyway it just made me think well what about what's wrong with paying prisoners um or, or people incarcerated i should say what's wrong with paying them and um i i could i could see ways and and in fact i wrote an article about it in in my my church's newsletter, you know, that, that it's a form of social justice to pay them. And we still get benefit to society because if these folks get paid, perhaps there's a, you know, a trust fund that is set out for each um, incarcerated person so that it builds and it builds and it builds. Maybe there is um, a trust officer. I don't know it, you know, do you control adults or do you give them the benefit of, of their own um, initiative? But at, at some point, they, they've got a bunch of money for housing, for education, um, you know, various things that, that, they can, that, that they can use to get themselves on their feet. And, and these are the things that we hear over and over again, the stumbling blocks, people who come out of prison and, and they don't have a safety net. And so then they go back. So anyway, um, I, I just felt very, um, very dedicated to this notion that, that um, Prop 2's indentured servitude had to go. And so glad it did. Yeah. Thank you, Katie. And you, you're reminding me that going back to what Melissa was talking about, how agitation can get us out of our, our comfort zone a little. This was uncomfortable for a lot of people. It was uncomfortable for them to talk about. But I, I, I hope, you know, whether it's our faith practice or social justice, that we understand that being challenged is how we grow. And in this way, I think we, we're giving people that opportunity to grow. So thanks, Katie. And I, I want to say Katie has been uh, an amazing help with our work here down in the South uh, through her affiliation with All Souls Church and also the Dummerston Community Church, where Sean, Sean Bracebridge is, is, the, is, the, is the minister. So thank you, Katie. 
Anybody else want to share a perspective on Prop 2? And how our, our organizing people working together all over the state helped make it happen. And I think it was pointed out earlier, um, when Colorado first put this on the ballot, it didn't pass. And, and the research said that a lot of people didn't know about it. And, and just this week, uh, Louisiana did not pass this. I well, think thank Rebecca you. Had her, I think Rebecca had her hand up. Did you? Oh, great. Something? Yes, I'm not sure. Um, but I think because I'm, um, me and my family, I think that the, um, I'm glad that I met Melissa and Debbie because they had a special event about uh, the racism because I'm um, in Vermont, it's very because they are judgmental of, they don't like uh, the discrimination of uh, a couple of a different race, color of law of the justice system. And I believe that in Vermont, the justice system of families going through trying to fight for custody, I think that in Vermont that needs to be fixed. Somebody needs to stand up and get get the system fixed and that we're all human beings. We're, we, we all bleed the same. And I believe that somebody needs to get this fixed of, um, of people going through the social justice. It doesn't matter what it is, it needs to stop. So I believe that somebody needs to stand up and let people hear people's voices. Thank you so much for sharing that, Rebecca. Mm -hmm. Are there any other hands up? All right, well, well, thank you so much. And uh, I think I'm passing the baton now to Debbie. <laughs> Debbie, you just muted yourself accidentally. Yes, I did accidentally. Ah! Okay, am I am I back? <laughs> okay. Um, right. So we we will we will uh, end in twelve minutes. I promise you. So what we've been trying to do today is give you kind of um, a mix of um, uh, the absolute foundational, um, you know, kind of basics of our model, and then um, some more nuanced. Um, things that that we also want to uh, draw to your attention, uh, trying to keep the mix going for those who are uh, veterans and those who are, are, are new. Uh, so I just want to touch on the um, uh, the last uh, couple of elements in our state kind of standard um, model, our standard organizing cycle. And uh, Melissa showed you um, that. Uh, so I'll just get that to you again as a little refresher. Um, yeah, there we go. Okay, so this is um, this is the idea. So the idea is that we start our organizing with listening uh, to each other, doing those those one to ones, and then um, the the talk about uh, that Mike was um, mentioning about you know taking the bread loaf and slicing it into uh, issue issue cuts into manageable portions of an issue kind of happens in this um, this area between listening and, and research. Uh, because sometimes when you listen to, uh, you do a listening campaign in your congregations or in your community, you'll hear, um, you'll hear a couple of different things maybe that sound like they might be an issue that you could work on. And sometimes you, you'll wanna do a little bit of research to um, see whether, you know, there's actually a, a, a smaller, slice, a more manageable slice of it or, or not. Um, and then, but then once you kind of choose your issue, the, the next um, couple of things in the, um, in the cycle um, are research. And by research, we, um, we don't mean, you know, looking things up in a library book or uh, just, you know, Googling things on the internet. Our research is as relational as every other aspect of our model. So when we do research, we sit down with um, people who uh, know about 
the systems that we're interested in finding more about. And we ask them questions and we interact with them and, um, and you know, have a, have a dialogue with them. And, um, and then that, and once we've done that for a, a long period of time, uh, we, we uh, feel like we're in position to move into an action. So let me stop sharing that and instead switch to another slide where I want, I want to talk a little bit more about what we're trying to do in, or in research, because I actually think in some ways um, that really is the, the crux of our model is where, is where we really start to understand an issue well, and we can really um, begin to understand how we can leverage our power to, to make change uh, around that issue. So, um, yeah, so here we go. Okay, so the, the goals for a research meeting are, are five, uh, basically. Um, we're, we're meeting with, with people who know about an issue um, so that we can gather information, first of all. Uh, we, you know, it's just really straight out. Um, sometimes we have, we use the saying that is um, you, you um, go in dumb and come out smart. <laughs> so we don't have to have, you know, we don't have to be experts in, you know, in issues. Uh, that's why we're going to go talk to somebody. We're going to try to find out more about uh, that issue um, and, and just really, you know, flat out gather information. But then also we are trying to, um, to establish a relationship uh, with with the person who is um, who is a decision maker. Um, so um, just to give you more comp concrete examples, um, we we worked several years ago on the issue of um, uh, the fact that there was no public transportation to um, the UVM Medical Center uh, outpatient facility in South Burlington. It was uh, a good ways away from the main hospital. It was also about three quarters of a mile away from the nearest bus stop. So people who didn't have cars um, were kind of, you know, had, had problems getting to it. Uh, but we had a research meeting with the general manager of the bus company because we wanted to find out how, did, how they decided on what bus routes um, to set up. So we went in, we asked questions to gather information. Um, we we also, you know, had uh, be, began to establish a relationship uh, with this with this person. He did, had no idea who we were um, at first, but you know, then he began to understand, uh, you know, uh, who we were and what we were about. And then uh, another thing we were able to do in that research meeting was to identify um, decision makers, so to make sure that uh, we were talking to the right people. Um, you know, he. he told us that, you know, of course, he, he was the general manager, but, um, you know, he was at the mercy of um, his funding, right? And that that often happens with um, when you're trying to figure out who the real decision makers are. Very often it's tied to, you know, who, who handles the purse strings, right? Um, so he told us, you know, he had trouble with, you know, uh, local funding and state funding and federal funding. So he, he was a little bit at the mercy of other, you know, other people. So he wasn't the ultimate decision maker. Um, so then we also, in our questioning, uh, were able to listen for possible solutions. Uh, so we wanted to find out from him, um, you know, can we, can we uh, start a new bus route? Is that, is that a possible solution? Uh, it turned out that wasn't actually the best solution. There were a lot of reasons why that wouldn't work very well. Um, but um, we, did, we did finally eventually come to um, the idea of having um, an on-demand shuttle that you had to call for uh, the day before, but you could, you know, you could set that up um, and if you didn't have a car, and, and that's that was the solution we settled on. But at any rate, we were listening, you were asking questions, listening for um, ways to solve the problem, and then uh, and then this one I think is particularly interesting. And in, in organizing, we, we also want to help people to. Um, uh, to make sure that they're being true to their own values, right? So this idea of uncovering contradictions uh, in that in this same example of this this uh, transportation to this uh, hospital outpatient facility, we met with the hospital too, um, a hospital vice president, and um, we reminded her that the mission statement of the hospital was to provide accessible health care to all the people in 
you know, in the area, in the Chittenden County area. And we said to her, so is the fact that you don't have public transportation that goes to the hospital, it, does that sound like, you know, you're living up to your own mission statement? And um, when we pointed that out, she got, she did get a little, talk about agitated. She did get a little <laughs> agitated. Uh, she was like, oh my goodness, you're making it sound like we're hypocrites. And it's kind of like, well, you know, if the shoe fits, uh, you know, but that that's where we helped her to see the contradiction in her own, you know, what she expresses her own values. So that was a that was a place where we could kind of push on her. And um, that's when organizing really works well is, you know, when you can, you can push on people and, and sort of uh, help them to see that uh, the solution that you're proposing or the, you know, or the, or the issue that you're pointing out really needs to be fixed. And the solution that you're proposing can help them actually be in line with their own values and what they, who, who they say they are. Um, so, um, so, so this is, you know, and re research really takes a long time. This is usually a very large portion um, time-wise of our uh, organizing cycle. And, um, and then it culminates once we, once we feel like we have enough information, we don't have to be absolute experts about things, but once we have kind of enough um, information, we have these signature events. Now, you know, we can do, uh, lots of groups do uh, press conferences or rallies or prayer vigils um, or sign-on letters. And we've, we've done all those different kinds of things, um, you know, at different times. But our, our real kind of, uh, our particular unique signature event is an event we call an action. And that's when, and we have them usually at one of our one of our congregations, um, you know, one of our places of worship. Uh, we invite all of the people uh, throughout VIA to come, so that we really demonstrate uh, our power in the numbers of people that we're able to turn out. We invite the decision makers that we'd like to, um, you know, ask questions of and 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 have them make commitments to the change that we propose. And we invite the press to come so that, you know, there's, there's some public attention on it. And then we go about presenting our argument in two ways. We do it, one, uh, with facts and figures. We, so I like to say we appeal to their heads. So we have a research report that, um, that shares all the facts that we found out from our research. And then we, we go back to those stories that, that Melissa was talking about. We have people share their stories of how the issue has affected them personally. And so in that, we appeal to the decision makers' hearts. We want to appeal to their heads and their hearts. And that's how we um, begin to persuade them um, to, to address uh, these systemic issues in the way that you know, we think will really, really make a difference. Uh, and so we do that at these, at these big events. Um, so if you haven't been to one of our actions, uh, we've been having them on Zoom. They're not quite as great on Zoom as they are in person. Uh, hopefully we'll have more of them in person, uh, you know, moving forward. But they're, um, they're really, you know, uh, great, great events. So that really kind of gets us most of the way through the model. Then, of course, we do, we also do reflection and evaluation and follow up uh, after, uh, after the action. That's kind of the culmination. So I have I have gone quickly through you know through the whole thing. Um, we've had you here for uh, quite a little while this afternoon, and I really appreciate your uh, your patience and your fortitude. Um, if anybody has a, a burning question or a comment, um, I would invite it in the last minute that we have here. Anybody want to say anything? Oh, uh, we got two, is, two people. Nancy, Nancy. yeah, I, Nancy. I would find wrong. it. I'd find it extremely useful to have the various sets of slides. Mm -hmm. I'm, a, I'm not a great audio listener and uh -huh. I've tried to take notes, but in the future, I think if there's, if, if it's material that's available, um, then you could take notes on that or ask, you know, things to do or follow up that we want for ourselves. Okay, so, yeah. But appreciated yeah, good... all the information, quite yeah. appreciated. Alrighty, yeah, I, uh, we can certainly make, the slides available afterwards, though. So, uh, so I'll, I'll be happy to 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 do that. We'll see. Terrific. You. Thank you. Yeah. Great. Thank you, Robin. Uh -huh. uh, yes. Hello, everyone. Hi. Sorry, I'm late. I just came in um, in the last uh, half hour. I'm a member of Burlington Quaker Meeting, and um, you know, for us, issues are certainly the slavery issue and uh, uh, and how to make our our meeting house and our property environmentally 
up to date and we're very concerned about the war in Ukraine and wanting to connect with more um, congregations and uh, feeling that uh, the churches need to step up with some of these social justice issues, especially the war in Ukraine. We just had a speaker, uh, John Royer, who um, I can send the link to you, Debbie, and maybe you can get it out. He traveled to Ukraine on a nonviolent quest. Um, and uh, so he has a report on that. And anyway, just glad to make contact with you all today and uh, hope to listen in also as uh, it's going on this afternoon, this evening, right? That's right. Yes. Yeah. At seven. Yeah. Thank you. Great. Uh, thank you for introducing yourself. And I'm, I'm the organizer for the Chittenden County area. So maybe you and I can get together offline and, and talk more uh, mm -hmm. about it. That's, okay. that's great. Thank you. So yeah, so awesome, everybody. Um, we will now let you go and have a nice break and have your dinner. And um, you can leave you can leave your connection on and mute yourself and and turn off your video. You know, stop your video um, if you want, and uh, and then come back at at seven. Okay, and we will we will see you then. I just wanted to say one thing um, before I go. I, I just wanted to look, um, thank Mike or um, the one that spoke about the racism. I am grateful that you came on today and spoke about the social justice. I was so excited and thank you for very, uh, thank you very much for talking about that today. It, it gave me the right things and keep coming to these meetings. Thank you, Mike. Thank you so much, Rebecca. Alrighty, we'll see you in a couple of hours. <laughs>